Hello and welcome to the Kemetic How-To Guide for Egyptian Pagan and Kemetic Practitioners. And for anyone else who might be stuck at home uh, because they're shut in for the coronavirus and need something to watch. Welcome, glad you could join us. I'm your host Sharon and obviously this is March 2020. We're doing a special segment uh, that's kind of related to the uh, corona pandemic. Um, we're talking about Sekhmet, the goddess, and her arrows, uh, which, you know, were symbolic for that in ancient times. When I say the word arrows, I mean, yes, like an arrow, except in a more metaphorical sense. And I'll explain that in a minute, because it's generally known that the goddess Sekhmet, there's some artwork of her, uh, was associated with plagues and pestilence. Um, some of her titles were uh, Lady of Pestilence, Mistress of Fear. Uh, but how exactly did that work? And who were the arrows? And what other deities had the power to control them? Let's find out. Oh, and uh, if you hear any commentary in the background, that's because my husband Darren is hanging out and watching with us. Um, he's having to, you know, stay behind closed doors because uh, the coronavirus is uh, a respiratory disease, and if you have a condition that, uh, you know, like asthma, COPD, something like that, uh, you really want to take extra precautions with the this virus that's going around because it could affect you more severely than it might the average person. So, um, actually, I'm just a really heavy breather. Hi, everybody. Love and miss you. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, so Sekhmet and Bastet, uh, they are both goddesses who acted as the Eye of Ra, and they are both connected to pestilence and plague. In fact, um, a fever was sometimes described as the hot rage of Bastet. Uh, the goddess Mut, when she combined with Sekhmet, also uh, could have power over pestilence, and the goddess Neith uh, could also act as the Eye of Ra, and uh, she had titles like Ruler of Destiny and Mistress of the Bow, so uh, the arrows were very much associated with her as well. Now, the arrows is a name for a class of entities that, in our parlance, we would call demons. In fact, you could legitimately study ancient Egyptian demonology, uh, but that would be a very obscure topic of research. I'm only just now starting to uh, dig up some things on that, uh, and you know, I'm going to share with you some of the things that I've found so far. The Shesaru uh, are the arrow demons. You also have the Khatiu, um, another class of demons that are under the rule of Sekhmet. And uh, the Shamayu are the wandering demons. Now, the wandering demons seem to be a group of stars, which would link them with another class of deities or demigods known as the deacons. Now, the, the deacons, that's a Greek name meaning ten, you know, like a decade. Um, if you'll recall, uh, there are 36 weeks in the ancient Egyptian calendar, and each of those weeks is ten days. Um, that's because every ten days, a new star would become visible on the horizon, and, uh, you know, that's how they kept time. That's why their weeks were ten days. And if you think about it, because they, they'd have a couple of guys sitting up on the roof of a temple watching, and one would be sitting there as a spotter, and the other one would say, okay, well, when a particular star is level with, you know, a certain part of his body, then they'd know what time it was. Which meant that they were probably telling some pretty crazy stories and dirty jokes to pass the time up there. Remember, they didn't have these things to keep themselves occupied. <laughs> well, each one of those stars... Uh, had a name and a particular entity associated with it. And um, you also had uh, seven demons that might have been the same thing as the seven arrows. The problem is the, the articles that I'm reading are not very specific, you know, or, or excuse me, they're not very consistent with their wording. One might call them arrows, one might call them demons. I don't know if they're talking about the, the exact same ones or not. But um, the seven arrows, they think... Um, or the seven stars, could be the seven stars in the Big Dipper, or they might be the seven deacons that uh, came around the time of the new year. And that would actually make sense because uh, seven weeks of ten days each gives you 70 days. 
that was not only the uh, length of time that the, the star Sirius disappeared and was not visible at any point in the night, and that's also the time that uh, Osiris was being embalmed. So 70 days had some significance, and so there might have, those seven weeks might have had some kind of uh, uh, particular portent, you know, because it's a transition, and so, you know, um, the thing with the deacons is they're very ambivalent. They can work either good or bad uh, influence on humankind, and so they might have had something to do with uh, plague and pestilence. That's also why Sekhmet uh, was associated with fortune and uh, the new year and the passage of time because she had power over the deacons. And again, this is in an article. They, they mentioned some artwork, and I'm going to have to find where it is, but supposedly she's pictured with the deacons on her throne. You know, so um, by the Greco-Roman period, uh, if not a little earlier, there was another deity who was pictured among those stars and uh, was described as having power over them, the power to control them. And that deity was Tutu. No, not that Tutu, but that Tutu. Um, the Greek form of his name is Titoas. And he is the son of Neat, usually pictured in the form of a sphinx. So that's see if you can see him in the light. There we go. Say hello. It was really, really, really tiny. <laughs> yes. Well, I've had this for a very long time, and uh, there's there's some history behind this particular piece. But uh, uh, I finally found a use for it because that's the funny thing for us now. Uh, sphinxes are so you know, universally associated with Egyptian motifs that uh, you can go and buy a Sphinx statue and, you know, I was like, what is it? Well, you could take that Sphinx statue and uh, consecrate it as Tutu, and you would be perfectly accurate in doing so. So, uh, Tutu's titles included Master of the Arrows, He Who Wards Off the Katyu Demons, and uh, Master of the Wandering Demons. Um, his job was to ward off evil. And uh, food, especially bread, was offered to him, and also sistrums. But not just any sistrums, specifically the kind with the looped handle, because you may recall uh, there were two types of sistrums. Uh, one uh, had kind of a box, and the little jingles were inside of it, and that w had a particular name. This one with the looped handle is called a Sekhmet sistrum. So the name. Uh, evokes the name of the goddess Sekhmet, and so it, this particular system was associated with her and also with other Eye of Ra goddesses and Tutu. So uh, I would think that in offering systems, the playing of systems would be, you know, offered to him as well to help him ward off evil. This role as controller of demons was shared by other sons of the Eye of Ra, uh, other deities who were the child of an Eye of Ra goddess, such as Mahes, uh, who was the son of Bastet, or in some accounts, Sekhmet. Uh, he had similar powers and titles to Tutu. So did Khonsu, as the son of Mut, uh, and he was associated with uh, fate and mercy. The god Nefertum gets so very little mention. You pick up books, and, and most of them might mention him, you know, as son of Sekhmet and Ptah, you know, having something to do with uh, perfumes, well, he also had the same role as the controller of, you know, his mother's demons. Um, and so in all of those cases, the Eye of Ra mother passed on to her son her power and dominion over her messengers. So what can Sekhmet, Tutu, and the Arrows teach us today? Many things, but most importantly for our current time, is that faith and science, you know, magic and medicine, don't have to be opposing forces. They should work together. Consider that the priests of Sekhmet acted as doctors and surgeons. Uh, ancient astronomers were also priests. And uh, if you think of the original Renaissance man of the Old Kingdom being Imhotep, he was an architect, a vizier, and a doctor. And later, he was identified as a son of Sekhmet. If you think about it, modern doctors and scientists are continuing their work today. So we need to listen to them as the servants of Jehuti and Sekhmet and Imhotep that they are. Not 
me ignore them as lonely voices crying in the wilderness, you know, saying, hey, young people, you need to go inside, you know, or <laughs> as, as they've been saying lately. Secondly, as this pandemic runs its course, don't panic. Think about it. Sekhmet and the other ancient Egyptian gods watched the end of the Pharaonic era, the fall of the Roman Empire. This isn't the, the first such issue they've seen, and this is not the end of the world. It's just a change. If you think about it, doctors can tell us how to take care of our bodies, but our gods can help us to nurture our spirit. So, with those thoughts, um, I want to give a shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. Thank you very much. Um, I've uploaded a, a blooper reel that you can only watch if you're on Patreon. Uh, I also did an early release of uh, the Let's Play that we did last month. I have some more content coming up. Uh, I'm planning a reaction video using ancient myths, and I'm going to have um, our lovely Darren and um, Morgan. I'm going to have the two of them come sit down and we'll watch that. Two males that know nothing learn something. Stay tuned. Yes. Yes, that, that's going to be the fun of it. I'm going to be reading from ancient myths and they won't know what is going to go on until they hear it. So that, that'll be fun. Um, once we make sure that uh, Morgan is, you know, clear of bugs. We're, so. we're wearing condoms, both of us. Just don't eat any lettuce. No problem. <laughs> anyway, I know that things are going to be tough for everyone for a while. This is a big transition uh, for all of us. Even though you know, Darren already works from home. You know, he's got a part-time job. Which, of course, that's going to be ending next month. Um, I'm trying to start up a job working from home myself. But there's still a lot of change going on with all of this. And my hope is to uh, have more helpful content planned and to try to be here for everyone. And uh, I really want to try and do some rituals again, maybe do some live streaming things. Um, the, sometimes our biggest challenge is just getting up and getting some food in the morning, you know, the, or on the weekends, sometimes it can be, you know, uh, early afternoon, it's like, oh god, I, don't, I gotta cook something, you know, <laughs> so uh, by the time I finally get us taken care of, it's like, uh, okay, this would be way too short notice to do a ritual, so we're gonna have to get this planned out, um, but hopefully we can start doing that and give you guys something to tune into and we can support each other as we get through this because we will get through it. Uh, it's just, you know, we're going to have to adapt. So for the Cometic How-To Guide, I'm going to give you a couple of new words. I usually finish with Senebti, which does mean be well. Um, there's a related Coptic word, Ujai, and that comes from Ujad. It means, you know, to, to be prosperous. And yes, for those of you who might be wondering, since I mentioned prospering, I believe if you were to say it in ancient Egyptian, uh, the words would be Ankhawi Ujjayi. Otherwise known as live, live long, long and prosper. prosper. Enjoyed this video? Then be sure to hit like and subscribe to the Kemetic Independent channel. You can also buy my books on lulu.com and shop for pagan supplies in my Etsy store. Check the description for links. And special thanks to all my Patreon supporters. Join us for updates, outtakes, and exclusive videos only on Patreon.